an almost incomprehensible horror. Luke's father, Greg, attacked his son with a bat and a knife. No one loved Luke more than Greg, his father. No one loved Luke more than me. Family violence happens to everybody, no matter how nice your house is, how intelligent you are. It happens to anyone and everyone. Rosie Batty's here with us this morning. The person uh, I know is talking about He you. says he was inspired by Rosie Batty's... The message has been so strong. have made a difference. But very quickly, you know, I'm an advocate. I'm the voice of family violence. I think that's the thing, isn't it? You know, I've got nothing to lose and nothing more to be frightened about. So I am in a position to be able to utilise and reach and, and really truly understanding that unless you are affected by family violence, people don't know how much of a problem it is. Family violence may happen behind closed doors, but it needs to be brought out from these shadows and into broad daylight. One in four children and at least one woman a week is killed. As the Australian of the Year, I am committed to building greater campaigns to educate and challenge community attitudes. I am on a path to expose family violence and to ensure that victims receive the respect, support and safety that they deserve. Excuse me. Thank you um, for inviting me to speak here today. It's really great to have the opportunity to share my story because you see, family violence does affect everybody. Doesn't matter how professional, how qualified, what kind of suburb, where you live, how rich or poor you are what kind of organisation you work within. You see, there are one in three women everywhere that are affected by family violence. We tend to assume it happens to those other people, those ones that live in bad neighbourhoods and the ones that we really don't expect to enter into our lives. But you see, I am one of those people like yourself. I have a corporate background. I have a professional background. I'm intelligent, articulate, articulate, strong. So if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. And it clearly does. But what I didn't realize when Luke unfortunately did get killed is there are still so many myths surrounding family violence. So much still gets unsaid, not discussed. We have a very ambivalent response to family violence. It's something is that it is unpleasant and confronting to talk about. So we're talking in this conference about transformation and it's really helped me reflect a lot. What is transformation? You clearly saw me in the video the day after Luke was killed. I didn't have a rehearsed speech. I didn't know what I was going to say. I was in shock. You're numb. You cannot process the enormity of what's happened. But I woke up and my house was full of people, friends, neighbours, people who just had to be together to try to cope with the enormity of what had just happened. And I could hear them discussing me, 
and they were trying to protect me and make decisions for me. But immediately, I've always been an independent, strong woman, and immediately I resisted the fact that they were making decisions on my behalf. And they were trying to protect me because they didn't think I should go to speak to the media. And I guess out of sheer determination, I, I went alone. To, and my intention was to actually ask them, thank them for coming, but to ask them to leave. But somehow I, I spoke. I didn't expect that it would be such a profound thing to do. But I've heard and hear constantly since then, hardened journalists have, were reduced to tears. They had never seen anyone be able to articulate so soon what had just happened in a context that they could clearly report. And that has changed, thankfully, that the media now are very much part of a journey to expose family violence, to highlight it, for, to educate people. Because what I didn't realise is people didn't know how prevalent it was. I am still telling people who still don't know that it is one in three women that are affected by family violence. One in three women here today in this conference one in three women in your workplace. One in three women, anywhere and everywhere you may be. When we start to really look at that in the context of our own lives, it becomes very uncomfortable. But it also starts to trigger thoughts, and memories. And very disturbingly, that is one in four children. Little boys, little girls. Do they grow up to be perpetrators and repeat the cycle of violence? Are their ability to enter into healthy, balanced relationships, is that permanently compromised? Do they transform and transcend their violent upbringing to become someone that has broken the cycle of violence? When I spoke in that video, I was saying one woman, a, one woman a week is being killed. This year, from the start of this year, it is now two women a week being killed. Two women a week. If this happened on the streets, on the local um, train station, like it happens outside nightclubs when someone's king hit, we would be in outrage. So I put it to you, why is it that we are experiencing two women a week being murdered by their current or former partner, and we either don't know or have done nothing to address this issue? When Luke was killed, I knew I wanted to make a difference. I didn't expect to be here today talking to you in this manner. I didn't expect to be Australian of the Year. So when I look at this, you know, call it a transformation, that I feel I have no real choice. There is always choice. But that's my drive, that's how I've always been. And you look back and you say, well, how did you, where do you get that from? People always ask me, where do you get your strength? Where do you get your inspiration? We don't just find it, it's been within you. It's how you were brought up, the role modeling of your parents and, and immediate family members, your teachers, your schools, the workplace, your colleagues, your friends. You know, you, you are transforming all of the time. So all of a sudden, you end up being who you are. And when you're as old as me, you can think, how the hell did I get here? So what I say to you is, what are your spiritual beliefs? What, is your, what are your values? What, are you, what is your authenticity? What do you stand for? What is important to you? What do you do about that? So that's how I've always been. I've always been made that way. 
And I think it comes from, well, I'm quite sure it comes from uh, several factors. And one of them is when I was six years old, my mother died suddenly, very suddenly from something that, she, a minor operation that she should have survived. And back then, things were a little different. No one told me she died. And she left my, me, my brother who was four, and my other brother who was a year old. So we were thrown into a chaotic situation. As a child, you are powerless, you are voiceless. As adults and parents, we don't always know the importance of communicating with our children and sharing and teaching them how to grieve, to feel. So that was a journey that I, I think, you know, at that point, I felt very alone. And I had a determination to do the best I could, to be the best person I could be. And the role models in my life happened to be my grandmother, Gertrude. She hated that name, and I don't think it's a name that's ever come back into fashion. Um, but she, she was inspiring because she was an ordinary woman. She was the center of a big family. We all loved her. At 100 years old, she still lived at home, fiercely independent. She was mentally alert and she enjoyed life. She was interested in you, me, interested in what was happening. She was a great inspiration to me. She was stoic. I came from that type of family. You just got on. And we had tragedies, we had other tragedies. But as families, you pull together and you support each other. So all of those kind of modeling and influences, I know have, have helped me now. So when I grew up, I grew up in a very small little community village called Laneham, a corner pub, a village shop. And you know, we, if you lived in, if you were born in Laneham, you were always accepted. If you were a newcomer, no one liked you. And you probably stayed in that kind of distrustful spot for you know, the rest of the, you know, you could be there for 30 years and people would still call you a newcomer. I can go back, even though I've lived away for 26 years, I'm still welcome and I'm still one of the village. So to have that kind of secure community spirit, I think has always been something, and it certainly was something I wanted to um, introduce Luke to. I wanted that kind of environment for him again, and I created that in Tyab. And once Luke, when Luke was killed, the community support that you hear about is there. People are genuinely good and caring and thoughtful and really want to help. That again continues to inspire you, to support you, to give you the hope in your life. When Luke was killed that night, it really is too much to process. But my thoughts were, oh my God, I've joined a club. I've joined a club that no one, no one wants to be a member of. And that's a club where I've joined those other tragedies. I'm one of the worst tragedies. How can I live with that stigma and burden? And I immediately thought of the three little Farquharson boys that were driven into a dam by their father and drowned. I immediately thought of the little girl who was thrown over the Westgate Bridge by their father, by her father, Darcy Freeman, and died. And I thought, oh my God, I am one of those horrible stories. How can I ever enjoy anything again? What has Greg done to me? You see, violence is not caused by mental illness. Violence is not caused by drug and alcohol abuse. Violence is a choice, a wrong choice. Greg killed Luke as an ultimate act of power and control to win. It was his last, the last thing he could do as he lost all of the control over me. So how we ever understand how a father who loved his son was tender and caring, attentive, protective, could actually kill him in that manner it's too much for me to comprehend and I still don't un understand. So it's a very confronting issue, but 
But no mistake, that family violence is a gender issue, as confronting as it is to hear it and for me to say it. We need to name it, we need to see it, and we need to call it out. It is a gender issue. And as we bang on about gender equality and women in workplace, in senior roles, this is why it is so important. Because those countries that do have gender equality have less incidences of violence. So it's not just a tick in the box exercise. It has a huge reason why. So what I learned is violence is about power and control. And there are many forms of violence. I didn't wear black eyes and broken ribs and broken bones. I was psychologically abused. I didn't live with Greg, and I was in the financially strong position because I had the career. It was my house, my car. I was financially responsible for Luke. So when we look at different forms of violence, what we need to truly get is violence can come the um, sexual, financial, it can be psychological or physical. But we are a society also that really don't recognize the dangers and the impact. And I question you and I say, what in your workplace do you do as a response to your staff or your colleagues who may be in a position where they're in a family violence? Because it will be happening in your organizations. And what I'm proposing is you need to know what you should be doing. You need to understand what your corporate culture says about this dynamic because you will have perpetrators in your organizations who have sexist attitudes. So who do you stand for? Where do you get involved? How do you handle this? These are questions, and you're all HR people. These are complex issues, very. But you can be guaranteed someone in your workplace will be battling them. What I want to ask for you today is I want you to think about this issue and what you can personally do about it yourself and how you can make some change. Do you, in, do you um, stand by and listen to some derogatory sexist comments? Do you not get involved when you know somebody close to you? is having a difficult time in her relationship. No, we need to stand out, stand up, and we need to challenge. Because that only then do we start to see the changes in these statistics. But one of the th important things I actually was going to spe speak to you about was when we're talking about transformation. I came from this little village. Um, people don't go very far. Some people in my little village never had even been to London or two hours further than the village itself. So really quite an insular, secure little spot. But I always had a desire to travel, to explore the world, to work overseas. But I was really, really scared, you know? Every, the world was safe for me. So I came to Australia as a backpacker when I was 24, everyone else had a backpack, and I arrived at the youth hostel with a suitcase. I, I kind of looked really silly. But I quickly ditched the suitcase and got the backpack and spent a lot of time traveling around Australia. I clearly looked very English, very straight, because I probably was the only one that have never had anyone approach me to sell me any drugs. Not that I took drugs, I was just offended that nobody wanted to sell me any. <laughs> so, it was a huge transformation to step outside of a small, caring community and go overseas and travel alone. And I thought, oh, people will look at me and think I haven't got any friends. I'm odd. They probably did. But I met other people, most of which were traveling alone. It was so empowering. You can do what you want, when you want, with no one having to conform. And I remember feeling so empowered that I thought, I can now do anything. I can actually 
go anywhere and do anything without feeling held back because I'm out of my comfort zone. I ended up actually meeting somebody and staying in Australia. Against all my plans, I actually ended up living here in Australia, and I've been here now 26 years. The first career position I got was as a consultant working for Drake International in the temporary recruitment division. So I started to make this transition from you know, administration and secretarial into consulting in the recruitment industry. I then progressed um, into the account management team. Let me tell you, I have never worked so hard. So it was selling recruitment into organizations at the time of the recession in the 80s. I don't know how easy it is for you now, but it was absolutely hard work. I learned how to call call, telemarket, um, be forced and pushed <laughs> out of my comfort zone hugely. I had three years in recruitment. What I remembered from them is that time is the camaraderie of the people I worked with. We were a really great team. I've never had to work under such pressure again in many ways, but it was a great foundation for me too, and I learned great skills. So, in my past, you know, I've had, I've worked for computer companies in their corporate sales, that their um, compact computers, IBM, Intel, in their consumer division. I've had really great roles. And I look back at that little girl who grew up in a small village where her mum died when she was six. And you realise that to transform, it is about stepping outside of your comfort zone, always. It's always about learning. Learning every day in some way, shape or form. Even if you're in a job that you know well, there's always a personal challenge that presents, or a person that presents a personal challenge to you to continue that journey of learning. So where am I now? I actually don't know how long I've been talking for. I'm hoping I'm going to get a, a reminder because otherwise you'll be here all day. Um, and once I start to see you um, rolling your eyes and falling asleep, I'll know I've talked too long. What I want to do today is just, you know, it, it is, I, I remember being inspired by other people whether it was Nelson Mandela or Mother Teresa, you know, who, who inspires you? I find it very difficult to think that I am one of those people because people say, how do you get up every day? And I think, well, actually, I get up every day just like everybody else. I get out of bed, make myself a cup of coffee. So I don't think we always understand the strengths we have, the role modeling that we present to our children. I feel like I'm an ordinary person, and that is because I very much am. Within a, a day or two of Luke dying, and you saw how I presented on that day, a couple of days afterwards, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, rang me, and he continues to ring me every day to make sure I'm all right. And he said, Rosie, tidy yourself, footwoman, you look like shit. <laughs> I thought, I'd laughed. I laughed. You can still laugh, you know? And having someone cut through and be able to speak to you that's not fearful of upsetting you actually becomes really liberating. What I really enjoy now is people actually come up and speak to me and say, hi, Rosie. They don't have fear in their eyes about upsetting me or what do they say? So really, you know, that, that time when Luke died, I thought, how can I ever enjoy a good wine, a good meal, the theatre? How do I enjoy life again? Look, Greg has stripped this back from me. But I do still enjoy life. And it's actually the people in your life that make the journey in so many ways. Their belief in me, their support, their compassion, their care, their love. It, want, it, you know, it supports me, and 
there are times when I do lose it. There are times when you are so affected emotionally that you don't handle certain situations well. People's understanding of forgiveness means a huge amount to me. Because I, I, I look at the world sometimes, and particularly in the workplace, and I've, I feel we've become so judgmental and so critical, and we give little space for people to sometimes screw up, to make a mistake, to actually handle something badly. So I'm really thankful that I have a lot of people like yourselves who are now understanding my journey. Instead of dismissing a, a, a family violence story, maybe they're starting to see how often it is happening. Nearly every week you see on the radio or in the papers somebody else that's being murdered. It can be really overwhelming to think, what kind of world do we live in? What's the point? What can we do? Well, there are lots of things we can do. I still have hope. I still have faith. And I, that inspires me to keep doing what I'm doing because I believe I am making a difference and perhaps making more of a difference than I ever set out to do. Now, before I wrap up, I'm actually going to write, read a couple of little letters. Um, people ask me, what was Luke like? Well, he was a funny kid. It was important for him to be funny. He wanted to be the class clown. I don't think his teachers actually wanted him to be like that, but he, that was what he wanted. And when people say to me, what would Luke say to you now? What would he be thinking? He, surely he'd be proud. And I think all kids are embarrassed by their parents, very embarrassed. So he would be very embarrassed, but he would be very proud. But this is what he would say to me. Mum, yeah, well, yeah, I am proud of you. But can I be honest? Yes. You're looking a bit fat. <laughs> That's my next transformation, losing an extra 15 kilos. Um, but I just want to share a couple of little letters that give, you know, I found them the other day because I was looking for something. They're really special and they're funny. And it shows you a spirit of a little boy that actually um, had a crush on a, a little girl. Um, when he was nine, nine or ten, and ten perhaps, he adored Taylor and never wavered for at least over a year, which I thought was quite incredible, his loyalty. But he was on school holidays once and he said, Mum, I've written a letter to um, Taylor's mum and dad. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, and it was all sealed. And I said, well, maybe you'd like me to have a look at it before you give it to them. <laughs> Thinking, what the hell is he writing? So this is the letter. It says, hello, Taylor, or Mrs. Walsh, or Mr. Walsh. I have loved you or your daughter for some time now. And turn it turns out two other boys I know like her, maybe three. But I'm going to tell you about them and me first. We have Isaac. Isaac is a girly type. <laughs> a guy who combs his hair for 20 minutes a day. He watches every TV every morning to be late for school. He thinks it's cool. Then it's me. I'm Luke. I'm an active, funny guy who can do a perfect cartwheel for a boy. <laughs> I would take care of Taylor as long as I live. Then there is Lockie. He's like me, but I'm faster. I'm faster than everyone. I'm going to mention Lockie has a lot of fun stuff, but he's really mean to me at times. So there you have it. Am I the one? Please send back from Luke. <laughs> so then I read the letter and I said, amongst trying to hold my laughter, I said, well, Luke, maybe you'd like to write another letter, because it's not really nice to mention other people and, you know, pull, put them down. So this is num letter number two. He said, hi, Mr. Walsh, Mrs. Walsh, and Taylor. I love Taylor, and three other boys like her, but I like her the most. I'm going to tell you about me. 
I'm a sweet boy inside, and I'm an active happy boy with lots of fun active stuff. I am sorry if this has made anyone angry, but please send back. I can do a great cartwheel for a boy, <laughs> and I will take care of Taylor as long as I live. From Luke. So thank you, and I, on that kind of funny note, I will say goodbye, but I do understand that if you've looked for my LinkedIn profile, you'll be sadly disappointed because that's one of my now ticking the box to do as quickly as I can. <laughs> so please follow what I stand for. Keep active and interested in that space. I'd love to keep a connection going with, with you all um, through the Luke Batty Foundation where we have a website. We will be looking at launching a major campaign later in June. And if there is any kind of synergy or opportunity to work with your organisation, I certainly would welcome the opportunity to do so. Thank you.